Welcome back. Now, if you remember our last couple lectures, they focused on high frequency trading and the exchanges. Well, in this video, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about how fintech has been affecting the capital markets and fund flows. But before I can really do that, I, I think I should give you a pretty good background on the capital markets and fund flows to and from those capital markets. So what we'll do is I'll first talk about where the capital is in the U.S. and internationally. And then I'll talk about recent fund flows and changes to fund flow over the last several quarters. Next, I'll take a look at the relationship between passive and active management and how that relationship has been affected by the use of fintech and how that's affected fee structures. And then finally, I'll talk about how fintech has affected the alternative investments industry. So let's get started. So where is the money in the world today? Where are all of the investable assets? Well, they're spread out all over the place, quite frankly. Uh, Estimates as to the total value of investable assets differ depending on who you ask. Uh, some sources will tell you it's about $110, $120 trillion all told. I've seen estimates as high as $250 trillion, which I suppose if you're counting every asset out there, maybe. But uh, in the U.S., we've seen a significant increase in uh, security issuance in 2021. Uh, as of right now, though, managed funds control approximately about 60 to $70 trillion of, as we say, AUM, or assets under management. And AUM essentially means that these assets are overseen or managed by a certain portfolio manager or managers. The manager has the discretion to invest the assets in whatever securities they see fit according to their prospectus of their fund. And they, and they hopefully do so to the best of their ability. Now, getting an accurate estimate of the total value of investable assets by asset class is a bit difficult worldwide. And the reason for this is that there's just a large number of jurisdictions they have to collect the data from. Uh, so what I thought I'd give you, at least here, is a breakdown of the worldwide decomposition or uh, weights of assets in open-ended funds. So these are open-end mutual funds in uh, both the U.S. and internationally. Now, in open-ended funds, a large portion of the assets are equity, so about 44%. Another 20% are bond funds or may hold bonds in the fund. Uh, there are some managed funds, open-ended funds, that can be a combination of both, so equity and bonds, or maybe even equity bonds and real estate, for example. And then you have some other assets in those funds, money market securities. So these are short-term issuances of secu securities. So think T-bills or money market mutual funds or repos or some other asset, asset like that. Now, by region, the American region certainly represents the majority of open-end mutual funds. Uh, but Europe and then Asia and Africa certainly contribute a large portion each. Now, in terms of what investors in the U.S., or rather retail investors in the U.S. are investing in, here's a breakdown. And again, equities make up almost a majority of individuals' household income, or rather invested, invested income. Uh, a large portion of the remainder is comprised of mutual fund shares. So these are going to be invested in either passively or actively managed funds. Uh, people might also have some money in bank deposits or certificates of deposit. And then some of these other asset classes make up smaller portions. So corporate bonds, very small percentage, municipal bonds, munis, very small. And then also treasury debt and uh, uh, this this will usually be a, a much smaller percentage, although you can buy these directly on treasurydirect.com. Now that we have a sense of where the money is, let's talk about fund flow. Now, fund flow is the cash that flows into and out of various financial assets for specific periods of time. And this fund flow, the reason we see so much of it through time is because not only are investors investing regularly, but they're also trying to time the market. 
And they do this by selling assets if they believe that there's going to be a recessionary period or aka a contractionary period in the next quarter or the next month. A lot of investors are skittish. If investors are bullish, let's say they believe that there's a very good bull run coming, let's say a a period when the market is expected to significantly perform well, then we might see increases in fund flow or a, a larger change in fund flow. Now, when we talk about fund flow, what we're really talking about is this formula right here, where we take the, the total dollar value of share purchases and we subtract from that share redemptions, aka outflows from the fund. So if I pull $15,000 out of a mutual fund and someone else puts in $20,000 to that fund, the net flow or the net fund flow is that $20,000 minus $15,000 or $5,000. Now, in terms of fund flow, here's some recent data on the uh, global fixed income and equity issuance. Uh, and so right away, we have green here, which represents equity, and we have fixed income, which is obviously the light blue. And so in 2021, there were approximately $26 trillion, $26.8 trillion worth of fixed income or debt issued. And so you might be wondering, why is that so much larger than the equity issuance? Well, straightforward reason, these bonds, they mature. So these bonds might be maturing in a year, five years, 10 years. Well, if they mature, then whatever entity issued them is inclined to probably issue more bonds uh, once these issues are, are uh, let's say, have mature. Whereas with equity, this equity, it potentially has an infinite horizon, an infinite lifetime. So this is why so much less equity is issued every year, but we do see a very large percentage of the markets comprised of equity. Now in terms of issuance of equity in the United States, we do see a bit of a breakdown. And in green here, we have IPOs. So an IPO is an initial public offering, and it means that a company is selling its shares to the market or to everyone for the first time. So it's once these shares undergo an IPO, they'll start to list on a public exchange like the NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange, and anyone can trade them. Now, these blue areas represent secondaries, and this is the secondary equity offering market. This market happens or takes place when a company has already listed its shares on an exchange for the first time, but they still need to raise funds. So this market has historically been a touch larger than the IPO market. You know, you have companies out there like, oh, a good example would be Tesla, where Tesla it undertook its IPO in the early 2010s, and then over time, it's needed to raise more funds. So what it does is it goes back on the secondary equity offering market or the SEO market, issues shares in exchange for a certain amount of money per share, and then it uses that money to invest in new capital budgeting projects. And then down here we have preferred stock, which is kind of like a hybrid between bonds and equity. And this is not nearly as common in, in some cases, a uh, firm won't even have preferred stock on its balance sheet. So, you know, it's, uh, the again, this one has no time horizon. If you buy shares of preferred stock, you essentially receive a set dividend forever. Now, in terms of flow of funds into long-term mutual funds in the U.S., here's what we see. So I pulled this data as of the end of September 2022, and as you can see, fund flows tend to fluctuate greatly through time. We see this positive fund flow indicating that investors are investing more than they're pulling out of the market until about, oh, March or April of 2022. And then right about the time the markets start to contract, this is where we start to see a massive amount of outflows from the market. So investors likely got skittish and they started pulling their money out and this is what we've seen for really several of the last couple of months. It's only August where this turned positive. 
I would wager that given the bad news in September, we probably see a touch more uh, negative uh, fund flow or net fund flow. Now, we can decompose the fund flow into a couple of components. And this blue area, it represents a large number of funds. But this orange area, this is what we typically refer to as intermediate core. Or sometimes you can think of these as uh, investment grade US fixed income issues. And so this will include, oh, government debt, corporate debt, securitized debt, really all the, the investment grade debt. So this is the good stuff, the stuff that comprise, that represents the debt of companies that are unlikely to default on their debt obligations, this orange area. The blue could represent uh, non-investment grade or junk bonds. And it historically has represented a large portion of uh, the, the fund flows. Okay, so now that you have a sense of where the money is and where it's going or leaving from, I think it's time for me to talk about passive versus active management. Because I'll mention this a couple of times, not just in this video, but also in future videos, because it is an important topic when we talk about investments overall. And so knowing what this is or what these terms are or what they mean is very important to understanding how certain investors invest. Now, when we talk about actively managed funds, what we typically mean are funds where a fund manager will pick stocks or identify stocks that are undervalued or overvalued, and they'll adjust their weights of those assets in the, in the portfolio based on their belief of those assets being undervalued or overvalued and the correlation or covariance between those assets uh, in the portfolio. Now, these actively managed funds, we have a fund manager, but we also often have analysts. And these analysts are performing analysis on the various securities that the fund could invest in. And it's their job to essentially identify these undervalued or overvalued securities. Uh, now, when I say that a fund is actively managed, what I really mean is that you know there is a decision as to whether to invest in a certain security or not to invest. Uh, a good example of this might be ARK Innovation ETF. Now, ARK is pretty famous, and it's famous because of what it is. So ARK, it's an ETF that allows investors to essentially invest in a portfolio of innovative securities. So if I go over to the portfolio tab here, we can get a sense of the securities that are being held by the ARK Innovation ETF. And so the majority of these assets are U.S. equities. Uh, they are, uh, we do have some non-U.S. equities, so international securities here as well. And we have an indication of the, a breakdown of the securities in the portfolio. Now, ARK is this blue dot here. So a lot of the securities are you know, small cap, mid cap, large cap. So we see all manner of securities. Uh, average is mid cap. And notice here that on the value to growth relationship, we see certainly there's, we're very, very heavily weighted toward the growth side of this, uh, this plot. And what this indicates is that this fund is investing in primarily growth stocks, stocks of companies that, uh, these might be fintech firms, they might be highly, highly innovative firms. Uh, so if I go down to the portfolio, you'll get a sense of what's in here. So Zoom Video Communications, Roku, uh, CRISPR, Tesla, Teladoc, all of these companies are innovative firms that offer innovative products. And the manager of this firm, Kathy Wood, it's her job to essentially identify those innovative securities that are potentially undervalued and invest in them. Now, this is a little different from a passively managed fund. And these passively managed funds, uh, they don't adjust weights based on analysis. So you really don't have a whole lot of analysts for these funds. Generally, what these passively managed funds do is they'll track a benchmark index and they'll hold the weights that, are, that correspond to the weights in the index. So the best example I can give you of a passively managed fund 
is the S&P 500 ETF. And this S&P 500 ETF, sometimes known as the SPIDER because its ticker symbol is SPY, it holds the securities that are in the S&P 500 index in essentially the exact same weights. So if I go over to Portfolio and I look over here at our style map, what you'll notice here is that this fund, this ETF, holds mostly large stocks. And we see a variety of value versus growth stocks here, but notice here they're all pretty much values. They're all pretty much large cap stocks. And this, the reason for this is because the stocks in the S&P 500 index itself are large caps. So there, this is a large cap index. And what this ETF is doing is it's building a portfolio of securities, large cap stocks that has the same weights of those stocks as are in the index itself. So if I go down to the actual portfolio, what you're going to see is that it's comprised of a lot of very familiar stocks like Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, uh, Alphabet, United Health Group. All of these are S&P 500 firms. And the weight of these assets in the portfolio corresponds to the, their weight in the actual underlying index. If the index adjusts the weight of Tesla upward, then I would expect the ETF, the exchange-traded fund that's managed by a manager, to adjust its weight of Tesla in the portfolio upward as well. Now, there's an ongoing argument as to whether passive or actively managed funds outperform the other. A lot of academics have stated over the years that actively managed funds, once you account for the fees that they charge, which are much higher than those of passively managed funds, significantly underperform passively managed funds. So for example, the famous author and researcher Ken French, he performed a study where he looked at managed funds or actively managed funds from 1980 to 2006, and he presented his findings at the annual meeting of, I believe, the Financial Management Association. And he found that over this time period, actively managed funds underperform passively managed funds by about 0.67% per year, or 67 basis points per year. However, there is some evidence out there by other researchers, uh, notably Kaspersik et al. in 2017, that shows that in some cases, managers can have skill. So these authors right here, they show that that skill can be comprised of timing ability and stock picking skill. And those skills will become more prevalent depending on the market that we're in. So for example, if we're in a bull market, then stock picking becomes more important because if you can pick a couple of good winners, say a very, very rapidly growing tech firm like Tesla in, oh, let's say 2013, you might have done very well. You very likely outperform the market. However, in, say, the current climate where we might be heading into a recession, market timing becomes much more prevalent or much more valuable. And so a good manager who can time the market is likely to outperform the market. And so different managers might actually have different skills. Some might be good at stock picking. Some might be good at market timing. And it's possible that these findings of researchers like French or uh, his co-author his co Jean Fama, uh, they might not be accounting for different skills through different market periods. Now, regardless of whether you believe passively or actively managed funds are better, uh, one thing is very clear. Actively managed funds that have superior performance historically will experience greater fund flow. Essentially, managers that can demonstrate some skill or some ability to outperform their benchmark or beat the market for several quarters should expect to see a large amount of investors piling money into their funds. And historically, what ends up happening here is this increased fund flow. It'll increase the assets under management of the fund and if this fund is getting paid based on a percentage of the assets under management, or AUM, that means that this manager gets very wealthy very quickly. I mean, if you're charging a 1% fee on, 
or expense ratio on uh, AUM at the end of every year, and you've got, oh, let's say $50 billion in that fund, I mean, you're, you're walking away every year with a very large uh, amount of money as a manager. Now, the problem with this is that a lot of times, or there are many researchers out there, a good example would be Burke et al. 2004, that show that these funds can actually grow so large that they exhaust even the best manager's investment opportunities. So let's say you have the best manager on earth, but they really only have skill when picking stocks in, let's say, the utilities market in the United States. Now, the problem is there's only so many stocks that can be invested in uh, in that particular sector of the economy. And if you pile money into this fund where this manager has this incredible skill to pick utility stocks, what you're going to see is that uh, this manager, they will very quickly be unable to identify undervalued additional utility stocks. So over time, what we see is that these funds that get very large or have very large AUMs historically underperform the market as they get very, very large. Now, if we were to compare the fund flow or assets under management of ETFs and mutual funds, what we're seeing year over year is that ETFs or exchange traded funds are rapidly increasing their assets under management year over year. And they're essentially getting very close to surpassing the fund flow of mutual funds. Now, not all ETFs are passively managed and not all mutual funds are actively managed, but this is a pretty good breakdown of or way to think about active versus passive management. Uh, the big takeaway here is that passive management or passively managed funds like ETFs have become much more popular in recent years than mutual funds, or at least investors are more willing to pile money into ETFs than they were 10, 15, 20 years ago. So how are actively managed funds adjusting to the rise of ETFs? Well, first, they're starting to reduce fees. We can see that by just taking a look at the average expense ratio of various mutual funds through time. So the expense ratio is the percentage that investors pay every year for the privilege of investing in that mutual fund. So if we take a look at equity funds, you know, going through the late 90s, 2000s, that expense ratio is, oh, we'll say about 1%. As we go forward in time, back down to 2020, that expense ratio has been cut in half. So as the usage of ETFs has increased, mutual funds are starting to cut their fees in order to compete. And we can see that with bond funds and hybrid funds and money market funds uh, just as clearly. I mean, essentially, expense ratios in this industry over the last 20, 25 years have been cut essentially in half. If we look at hedge funds, this difference is just as stark. Now, hedge funds, these are funds that can invest in pretty much any investment strategy that they want to. So if they want to go up and, oh, let's say, short a bunch of securities, they can. If they want to buy up defaulted government debt from, let's say, the country Argentina and then sue the country for defaulting on that debt and win in U.S. federal court, they can. And in that case, they certainly did. Uh, so these hedge funds, they're much more risky than your traditional mutual fund because they can invest in just about any asset, any legal asset. But because they take a much riskier approach and they have correspondingly greater risk, they typically come with higher expenses. And historically, those expenses were referred to as the 2 and 20 fee structure. What this means is that if you invest in a hedge fund, your expense ratio an annually is 2% of what you've invested plus 20% of the profits earned by the hedge fund. So if, let's say, you had uh, $100 invested with this hedge fund, uh, you're paying $2 at the end of the year to the hedge fund as an expense ratio, and depending on how they define that 2 and 20 you're paying, let's say, oh, if there was a $20 profit on 
your investment, you're paying $4 on the, uh, the profit. Now, over time, just like mutual funds, hedge funds have seen their incentive fee and their management fee decline. So the management fee is that 2%, the expense ratio, as it's sometimes called. And so historically, I mean, starting with 2008, you can see this reduction through to 2020. The incentive fee, this 20%, uh, that has also fallen. Uh, this is here to essentially incentivize the, the fund manager to take some risk because if they turn a profit, they get a cut of that profit. Now, there are other ways that actively managed funds are adjusting to the rise of ETFs. And this is really where I get to finally start talking about fintech and how it's affecting fund flow. Now, one of the first ways that managed funds are adjusting to the rise of ETFs is through the use of artificial intelligence, or AI, and machine learning. Now, we'll go into a very deep dive near the end of our class on these techniques, and I'll show you a couple of examples, but many funds nowadays are using essentially bulk amounts of data, I mean just large data sets, and training an algorithm on those data sets. So for example, there's all kinds of techniques out there like support vector machine, all kinds of clustering techniques that can be, that can be used. Essentially, the goal here with managed funds is to find some relationship in that data. So if, oh, let's say every time the Packers win a football game, uh, the, the tech industry sees a 2% return on the following Monday. Well, machine learning could be used to find that relationship and a um, managed fund might be willing to trade on that. The downside here is that that could be a spurious relationship, an artifact of the data, but you know, machine learning is allowing managed funds to process massive amounts of data very quickly and find relationships. Another way that fintech is affecting managed funds is through the use of remote working. Now, remote working has been prominent for years in investments, but with coronavirus, I mean, essentially, it's just become far more common. I mean, if you're an analyst working at an actively managed fund, you're spending a lot of time on your computer sitting in front of code, whether that's SAS code or Python code or, oh, let's say Stata or some other coding software, you're sitting in front of your computer and you can really do that anywhere. I mean, a large number of hedge funds and mutual funds hire individuals that are not working at the, the corporate headquarters. We're also seeing a rise in the use of cloud computing and storage. You know, sometimes it's just cheaper to hire AWS or Google or Microsoft to essentially house your data and store your data rather than just purchase in-house servers and maintain those servers. Asset managers are also being pressured to provide more analytics. So nowadays, if an investor wants to know how their fund that they've invested in is performing, that fund manager needs to provide a lot of information, not just the return and the portfolio weights, but also all kinds of other metrics. Oh, M squared, the sharp ratio, tracking error, the breakdown of style analysis, all kinds of other metrics could be reported by the manager. And so uh, investors are more demanding nowadays than they have been in the past. And FinTech makes it possible to for the managers to provide a lot more analytics. And then finally, we've seen a massive increase in the use of APIs, whether these are, or the, the fund has to pay for these APIs or whether they're open APIs. Really, we've seen a rise regardless. And APIs, what they do is they provide low-cost data for the fund. So the fund, as it tries to identify trading strategies that might be profitable, they can use APIs to link in and have access to a large amount of data that otherwise they'd have to collect themselves. So these are very important, and fintech is making it possible. Now, I took these results from a recent survey put out by the Financial Times and another partner firm, and I thought it'd be a good idea to give you a sense of what people in the fund administration or fund management industry are saying. Uh, so how significant are some of these advancements in this industry? Well, a lot of the individuals surveyed believe that cloud computing is very significant or somewhat significant. They also believe that mobile tools are incredibly significant. 
Uh, they especially believe that big data and analytics are important. And like I said, big data, AI, the use of machine learning, neural networks, etc., all of these are techniques that fund managers can use to find some relationship between returns and a huge number of variables that they can just throw into uh, some software program. Uh, Robo-advisors, uh, a lot of people in the fund industry or managed fund industry view these as yeah, somewhat important, uh, but it's a bit more neutral here. And then finally, social media uh, feelings are a little more mixed there. I mean, some people believe that's very, very significant, but a, a large percentage believe, okay, or tend to be pretty neutral. Now, beyond the value that fintech has provided or is providing managed funds, we also need to take a look at how fintech firms are increasing investment opportunities. And you can see this in many different ways. First, fintech firms provide the ability to invest in uh, fractional shares, and this is just a, a small in way that fintech is making investment possible for less fortunate individuals, but let's say you want to spend $1 to buy a single uh, share of stock, or let's say a portion of a share of stock. Well, fintech apps like Robinhood will allow you to do that. You can buy $1 worth of Apple. You can also buy $1 worth of some crypto asset or some other asset, uh, the choices are fairly limited, but the point is these fintech firms are allowing investors to buy fractional shares. We're also seeing a rise in the investment of fintech firms by private equity firms. So PE firms, historically what they do is they, they buy up a, an equity stake in private firms, and a lot of fintechs are privately owned, and these PE firms, uh, their goal is to essentially get in early before these, these fintech firms actually undertake an IPO or are bought up at a higher price. Now, if we want to see just how significant that growth in private equity investment into fintech firms is, uh, we can look at all kinds of metrics. A good metric might be the, the number of deals that are happening. And we can see almost a linear relationship here through time. Uh, so private equity firms in 2019 invested in, oh, somewhere just shy of 100 uh, fintechs. But, you know, in 2018, they'd invested in over 100 different fintechs. And the last point I want to make here on how fintech firms have increased investment opportunities for uh, investors is that fintech firms have actually increased investors' access to what we typically call alternative investments, which is an asset class that a lot of individual or retail investors typically don't have access to. So what are alternative investments? Well, alternative investments are supplemental strategies to our more traditional investment asset classes like stocks, bonds, uh, munis, cash. Essentially, alternative investments is kind of a catch-all for much more risky asset classes like hedge funds, private equity firms, natural resources, infrastructure, real estate. And historically, uh, in order for an investor to invest in this asset class or invest in certain types of these alternative investments, you had to be what's called a, an accredited investor. So if you wanted to invest in a hedge fund or a private equity fund, uh, you typically had to be uh, fairly wealthy. So the requirements for being an accredited investor according to the SEC were, or still are, you have to have an annual income of at least 200000 per year, or with your spouse's income, have an income of, or combined income of 300000 per year. Now, the reason that the SEC requires a lot of investors in this space to be accredited investors is because these alternative investments, they're not publicly traded, and they're very, very illiquid and they have a very, very high amount of information asymmetry. I mean, quite frankly, like I said, hedge funds can invest in some very, very risky assets. They might actually lose the majority of their funds. Same thing with uh, some other projects. And so because of this high information asymmetry and high risk associated with these alternative investments, uh, the SEC has imposed this requirement 
uh, for investors. Now, fintech is playing a major role in the evolution of the alternative investment space in a couple of ways. First, fintech firms are increasing the access to alternative investments. Nowadays, depending on the fintech firm, investors can invest as little as ten or $15,000 in, say, a private equity firm or some other alternative investment. We're also seeing a lot of these fintech startups reducing the transaction costs associated with this, this industry or the, the asset classes in this industry. And a lot of these fintech firms, uh, they might focus on, say, investment in farmland or private equity or hedge funds. Uh, each of these is a little different, and there are a, a large number of them. Now, let's take this one, for example, Farm Together. So Farm Together allows investors, and these still have to be accredited investors, to invest in small amounts of farmland. They allow you to invest a smaller amount in farmland than you would have to if you wanted to actually break into this market yourself. Uh, so if you're buying farmland by yourself, you might have to buy several acres at a time or a, a large number of acres at a time. Uh, with Farm Together, however, what they do is they go out and identify possible deals and allow investors to buy into those deals. So let's take a look at this. So Farm Together offers really three categories of investments. They have what they're dubbing crowdfunding offerings. So you still need to be accredited, but these offerings start at $15,000 and allow you to essentially pool your money with other people's funds and invest in large plots of farmland. Uh, you can also invest in a, a larger portion of farmland. And then lastly, this startup will go out and find you a, a bespoke opportunity. So a specific opportunity that meets your criteria and they'll identify that farmland and make that investment for you. Another fintech firm that has been very popular recently is Moonfair. And Moonfair this firm allows you to invest in private equity and specifically uh, venture capital funds. Uh, so again, you have to be an accredited investor and the minimum you can invest is $75,000, but we can actually view the funds that are open for investment. So if I scroll down here, you'll be able to see the, uh, a couple of past examples of Moonfair's funds. So, for example, we have the Moonfair Feeder A40 fund, and there were 151 investors in this particular fund. Uh, it had a total commitment of $45 million, and the average investment was $300,000. If I click on it, you can see some additional information. The geographic fo focus of this fund was North America. Uh, it was open for fundraising for about 52 days, had an investment period of about six years, so it's still ongoing, recently started, and its sector focus were right here. So we, we get a sense of where this fund is investing. And we can also get a sense of who these investors are. A huge percentage of them are from Europe, and we know the backgrounds of the investors, so a lot of uh, financial services professionals or uh, maybe people who didn't want to disclose that. And there we go. Now, there are a huge number of other fintech firms that allow investment in private equity, hedge funds, real estate, etc. So I decided I'd put up a list of them here. And if you're interested in them, you can certainly take a look at them in more detail. So obviously, Moonfair and Farm Together are going to be on this list. But I, I just, I could have added more. I didn't, but feel free to browse to your heart's content. But as you can see, there are a huge number of fintech firms out there providing services for investors that want to uh, break into alternative investments. Now, admittedly, you're still going to have to be a, an accredited investor to uh, take part in a lot of these investments, but uh, you know that's true regardless of uh, any kind of technology that you'd be using. Okay, so let's summarize. So we talked about the where the money is, and then we talked about the fund flow in the United States over the last couple of quarters. So it should be pretty clear that fund flow is dependent on investors' expectations of future market conditions and also current market conditions. 
Uh, we also talked about the fact that actively managed funds are adapting to increase competition, namely from passively managed funds and uh, mutual funds are adapting to the rise of ETFs. And they're doing this in a couple of ways. Obviously, they're reducing fees, but they're also incorporating more fintech into their operations. They're using more bulk data. They're using AI. They're using APIs. They're using all kinds of techniques to try and get an edge on their competition. And finally, fintech firms are facilitating accredited investors' access to alternative investments in assets like private equity, real estate, hedge funds, all kinds of other assets that are getting away from our more traditional asset classes like stocks and bonds. So with that, I'm going to wrap up. And if you have any questions, obviously, please feel free to reach out. I hope you have a fantastic weekend, and I hope to see you soon. Thank you.